Hey friends, this episode of The Fellow on Call is not meant to be used for medical advice and is intended for educational purposes only. Patient information has been modified to ensure privacy. The views expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect the views of our employers. Enjoy! Welcome to another episode of The Fellow on Call, the Hemon Podcast. We're coming at you from Merlo University Medical Center. I'm Ronak. I'm Vivek. And I'm Dan. And in today's episode, we continue on our discussion of, about von Willebrand's disease, This time we focus on that type two. So last time we talked all about that quantitative abnormality in Von Willebrand's and today it's all about qualitative. Ready to talk about this. This is also a good time of the year with the new fellows coming in that we're releasing this episode. Just remember this is when the Von Willebrand don't work right. We're making it, but it ain't working right. I'm just excited that we're continuing to talk about benign hematology. And towards the end of the episode, we'll also talk a little bit about other treatment strategies for these type two von Willebrand disorders, type 3, and for your type 1 patients who don't respond to DDAVP. So kind of a packed episode, but stay with us. All right, guys, let's go ahead and roll that show. All right, Jill, we are about to start our second von Willebrand's episode. And I just want to say I was kind of reflecting back on us recording our first one. And Vivex Tennessee boy is really starting to show. This is his his inner Knoxville Eastern Tennessee vibes really really emanated in in the prior episode. What do you guys think? It was bound to come out eventually. I I'm, I'm very happy that it's this is the right episode for it to happen. You know, we were talking about rosé last episode and I had a little bit of rosé before we recorded it, you know. I was it was just time. It was the right time. You got to balance it out. Talking about rosé and then letting that Eastern Tennessee vibe come through. So uh, very, very happy to hear it. I hope it keeps coming. I, I never correlated rosé with Eastern Tennessee, but I may have to reconsider that that thought process. I thought last time's conversation was was really great. And as we said, von Willebrand's disease is really confusing, especially the diagnostic portion. There's all those charts and we have seen those up arrows and down arrows and you're like, what on earth is going on? But I really liked the conversation that we had last time where we tried to simplify the approach, at least for type 1 and 3. And I'm excited to do that now for type 2, which arguably I find more confusing than anything. We're going to make this easy for the listeners, give you guys some good mnemonics and some pearls from Dan the Man. So I'm going to start us off with a case. We have a 28-year-old male with minimal documented past medical history who established with a primary care earlier this year after he got better health insurance through his new job. And a screening CBC showed that he had a low platelet count. The PCP repeated the testing and even sent off viral and nutritional labs with nothing to explain the abnormality. Platelets were normal in appearance on peripheral sphere, and the patient didn't have splenomegaly on exam. Throwback to our thrombocytopenia episode. If you guys get confused, check it out. The PCP was stumped and sends the patient to hematology to consider a bone marrow biopsy. So how are we going to approach this patient when he comes to hematology clinic? Yeah, so just like before, we want to go through that bleeding assessment tool, and we want to see basically a structured history of any bleeding symptoms this patient might have had. When we went through that with him, he ended up scoring a four. He had frequent nosebleeds. It required cauterization on two different occasions. And he also had an intramuscular hematoma develop in his, in his right biceps after he uh, got hit by a pitch playing baseball in middle school. Never had any prior surgeries that he's aware of including dental extractions, and and hasn't really had any major traumas like motor vehicle collisions or any significant falls. Four or more in a male patient is considered pretty significant history. I'm growing a little bit more concerned. There actually may be something going on here uh, with this guy. So uh, what, what's y'all's next step? Well, so as we talked about last time, Dan, I think it's only appropriate that we send off uh, screening labs for von Willebrand's disease. And so like we talked about last time, perhaps a von Willebrand's factor antigen, a versicetin cofactor assay, a factor eight level, and then always want to get that type in screen. And of course, this time the patient's being referred for thrombocytopenia. And the first thing we talked about in that old episode is make sure you repeat that CBC. So that's, I think, where I would start. And that's exactly what happened in this case. And there, there's a few things I wanted to highlight there. As Dan went through how he did the bleeding assessment, we always ask our patients, did you bleed with any prior procedure and did you require transfusions? And that's a really critically important question. And we, we talked about that last week as well. So these labs came back that Ronick had ordered. The von Willebrand factor antigen was 58%. Ristocetin cofactor was low at 32%. Factor 8 
was normal at 64%. Type and screen showed O negative blood. And the platelet count was low at 94. So remember, a normal von Willebrand factor antigen is 50 to 150. And in general, for our factor levels, just that's a general good rule of thumb. 50 to 150% is normal factor levels or normal von Willebrand antigen. So in this case, we're making it, but it's not functioning properly with this ristocetin cofactor that was low. So looking at this, how exactly do you determine what to do next. And I just gave us the brief rundown. Okay, the qualitative defect is occurring in this patient, but how do we stratify from here and what's our next steps? Yeah. And you know, as you pointed out, there is a disconnect here. The activity level is lower than the than the antigen level. And oftentimes we won't see that they're exactly the same number. That's pretty common. But we have a cutoff that we look for. So if the ratio is 0.7 or less, so if the ristocetin cofactor activity divided by the antigen level is 0.7 or less, we consider that a big enough gap to represent a potential type 2 von Willebrand disorder. And so in this case, you know, you divide that out, the ratio is 0.55. That does put us more squarely into the territory of potential uh, von Willebrand disorder. And in this case, in particular, I think I already know which one I'm suspicious for based on the platelet count. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the different subtypes. But when you are suspicious for von Willebrand's type 2 of some variety, we want to send off some more advanced testing to try and further figure out what that subtype is. Ronan, do you want to tell us a little bit about what some of the other test options are? Sure. I will definitely need your help in understanding why we do what we do, but at least I'll try to recall from memory what's in those uh, really scary charts uh, that we used to study. So number one will be von Willebrand's factor multimers. You want to look at the actual size of the von Willebrand's factor. You want to get a ristocetin induced platelet aggregation, so it's called a, a RIPA, which is different than that ristocetin cofactor assay. I know that. don't really know what it does, but I know that. Von Willebrand's factor to factor eight binding assay. We also want to get a von Willebrand's factor to collagen binding assay. And then we want to consider doing a DDAVP stimulation challenge as well. And then I've seen a couple of patients with von Willebrand's in the in the clinic. And I think genetic testing is sometimes being done as well. So Dan, I'd love to hear about what these different tests do and why we do them though. For sure. Yeah. And genetic testing is becoming more and more something that we're offering for patients. As we'll talk about when we go through these different subtypes, there are some that can be really tough to parse out on functional testing alone. There's a lot of corresponding defects. This protein interacts with a lot of different things, right? So um, you can imagine if we know that there's a defect in the interaction between von Willebrand's and platelets. Okay, well, we can figure that out on functional testing, but how do we know if the defect is with the platelet or with the von Willebrand factor? So all sorts of different things. But in any event, let's go through it just how you went through it. Multiple analysis, that's basically an electrophoresis assay. So run the the von Willebrand factor on a gel, try and understand what the distribution of different multimers is. And a lot of these subtypes will see a preferential loss of certain weight, molecular weight ranges, and that can sort of help us figure out what subtype we might be dealing with. Ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation, that's similar to the ristocetin cofactor activity, but in this case, it uses a very low dose of ristocetin and includes the patient's own platelets instead of standard test platelets. That's a way for us to help figure out if the patient's von Willebrand factor is too sensitive to ristocetin or basically is too aggressive at grabbing onto platelets. The von Willebrand factor to factor eight assay looks at that chaperone function. In some subtypes of von Willebrand's, the chaperone function is what's deficient. And then the collagen binding assay, again, that's looking at how well the von Willebrand's factor is actually interacting with some of the basement membrane proteins. This can also be used as a proxy for electrophoresis if electrophoresis isn't available. The high molecular multimers are kind of best at interacting with the the basement membrane. So sometimes we can infer, you know, maybe there's a preferential loss of those high molecular weight multimers, but that's not a perfect proxy because there are also just defects in von Willebrand's that make it hard for it to interact with the basement membrane. We talked about the STEM challenge last time. You know, I do really think that we're going to see more genetic testing as as this technology becomes more widely available. Ultimately, a lot of these sort of more difficult to perform tests or the specialty coagulation tests that are run in specialty coag labs, they may become obsolete as we get better and cheaper genetic testing. Uh, Vivek, could you take us through some of these von Willebrand subtypes uh, within this 
dysfunctional category. And maybe that'll help us sort of solidify our knowledge of the testing as we'll kind of understand what's relevant to which type. Yeah, definitely. And this will really help out when we think about these subtypes and how each test helps us understand which subtype it is. So the first one, type 2A, this is the second most common type of congenital von Willebrand disease, accounting for about 15% of the cases. Remember, type 1 is the most common. Type 1 is dominant, right? It's autosomal dominant, the most common. And that's that quantitative loss. But now we're talking about this qualitative defect. So type 2A is a preferential loss of high molecular weight multimers, which are the most effective at assisting hemostasis. That RIPA test, that ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation studies, would show low activity because it's not overly sensitive to the ristocetin, so it's not that it's grabbing platelets too much. Like we talked about before, that ratio of ristocetin cofactor to von Willebrand antigen is less than 0.7. And these patients actually might still be responsive to DDAVP, and it does warrant a trial. So that's just one important thing to talk about there. That's exactly right. And what we're seeing here is the defect tends to be these proteins, this von Willebrand factor that's produced in patients with type 2A, the inherited form, congenital type 2A, is just easier for their body to break down, either ADAMTS13 cleavage or other non-enzymatic cleavage. That's why you lose those high molecular weight multimers, which again are the best at doing their job compared with all the other sizes of von Willebrand factor. We'll also point out that this is the type of acquired von Willebrand factor de deficiency that develops in folks with severe aortic stenosis or extreme thrombocytosis. So when those platelet counts are really, really high or when there's a lot of shear in turbulent fluid flow through a tight aortic valve, that von Willebrand factor is getting activated because either it's interacting with all those abundant platelets or it's getting unfolded in that turbulent blood flow. And again, those high molecular weight multimers are getting used up. We can see that acquired type 2A von Willebrand disorder in those scenarios as well. That makes so much sense. And another easy way, if, if you're just wondering, how do I remember that it's high molecular weight, is A is high achieving, right? I made an A in class, I'm high achieving, so you lose high molecular weight multimers. That's my uh, Knoxville, Tennessee coming at you. Next, we have type 2B. This is less common than type 1 or type 2A. It's a gain of function alteration where von Willebrand factor binds to platelets too readily, and as a result, the high molecular weight multiples are lost and platelets are cleared out of circulation. So really what's happening is, like Dan said, we our body will clear high molecular weight multimers quickly, and now they've already grabbed onto the platelets as well. So you're clearing your platelets, causing a thrombocytopenia. You'll see on the RIPA that it'll show increased binding with low-dose ristocetin because they're grabbing platelets so readily. And platelet counts can be within the normal limits, but are usually low. And Ronak, what else are we thinking about in a patient with type 2B? And I remember B binds platelets. A, high achieving, high molecular weight multiple loss. B, binds platelets. But what are some other facts that we need to know about type 2B? Vivek, the one thing that I had seen in, in one of these patients is that uh, DDAVP is not appropriate here, right? Because in this case, if you cause release of the dysfunctional von Willebrand's factor from the endothelium in the presence of DDAVP, then that von Willebrand's, as you said, already has a higher affinity for those platelets. So you're taking patients that typically are already thrombocytopenic, and then on top of that, you're giving them something that, that's going to bind those platelets and make them not functional anymore. So you're further uh, worsening their thrombocytopenia. So in this case, DDAVP is not ideal. Yeah, and that's that's really important to know, and it just makes so much sense that you don't want to make your platelets worse than what they already are. And some of these patients can have chronic thrombocytopenias in the 30s and the 40s. So the next one is type 2 M, M as in monkey. And I don't know a lot about this, so I'm going to let one of you guys take care of type 2 M and type 2 N. I'm still so mad that they decided that M and N were the letters they would want to assign to von Willebrand's subtypes. I have to use the NATO phonetic alphabet whenever I'm talking about these subtypes of von Willebrand's disease. So type 2 Mike, type 2 M, is rare, fortunately rare. It is a loss of function where either the platelet binding is decreased, basically, you know, like the opposite of type 2B. So it would decrease interaction with that GP1B receptor or the collagen binding function is decreased. 
And that's the mnemonic I use is M for matrix. So this is the one that causes it to not interact with the matrix or with the platelet receptor. Overall, we do see just a generalized decrease in von Willebrand factor levels. And, uh, and that ratio, again, is going to be less than 0.7. But there's a normal distribution of multimers in this diagnosis. We don't see a preferential loss of high molecular weight. There's sort of low across the board. Genetic testing can, again, be kind of useful here just because it, it can be a little bit difficult to suss out. You know, you get these normal multimer tests back and RIPA isn't available, or if collagen binding assay isn't available at your center, uh, it can be kind of tough to figure out what's going on. I definitely see a role for genetic testing in trying to pin down a diagnosis of type 2M, as in Mike. For type 2N, as in November, they named this for Normandy. I guess that was where it was first discovered. And I actually use that to my advantage, and we'll talk about the mnemonic in a second. But for type 2N, as in November or Normandy, Another rare defect, basically this is the loss of chaperone function. So this is where that factor VIII binding assay comes into play. That's how we can prove that this patient's von Willebrand factor is not very good at holding on to factor VIII. Typically, you'll actually end up seeing a von Willebrand factor level in the normal range, but a low factor VIII. So frequently, these patients are misdiagnosed as having a mild hemophilia A, a uh, mild factor VIII deficiency. But you do need to do that von Willebrand factor VIII binding assay as a functional test to, to prove this is what's going on, or again, consider genetic testing. Phenotypically, they are similar to patients with hemophilia A. And the way I remember this uh, subtype is that Normandy has eight letters. So for type 2 Normandy, it's factor VIII. But those are the, uh, the main subtypes of type 2 von Willebrand disease. So what do we see uh, on the patient's testing? So the patient's advanced testing that we got confirmed our suspicion for type 2B von Willebrand's disease. And what we mean by that is we did the multimer analysis, and we had decreased high molecular weight multimers, and a RIPA test, that ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation test, showed enhanced aggregation at low-dose ristocetin. So we're binding platelets, that GP1B receptor. But are we completely sure that's what's going on here? Uh, of course, there is still more to think about. Always with von Willebrand's disease, there's more to think about. There is one other diagnostic consideration here, and that's what I'd referenced a little earlier, where, okay, so we know the von Willebrand factor and the platelets are interacting too much. We know there's been a gain of function here, but we still haven't proved that it's because of the von Willebrand's. It's possible there is another sort of semi-subtype of von Willebrand's called platelet type von Willebrand's disease or, or pseudo von Willebrand's disease. That's where you actually have the gain of function on the GP1B, that platelet receptor that attaches to the von Willebrand's. It basically presents in an identical fashion to, to type 2B von Willebrand's disease because it's the same issue. You have an increased interaction between the same two things. Genetic testing really is going to be the way to go here. So oftentimes, if I'm worried about type 2B, I tend to want to do some genetic testing to prove that that's what's going on. That may be something that's specific to our center where we have that available, but it is probably the most reliable way to differentiate. There are a few tests out there, but they are sort of esoteric coagulation tests, including the cryoprecipitate challenge test. It's basically like a mixing study. It's constructed in a similar way where the patient's platelets are washed and then mixed with cryoprecipitate. They'll aggregate in platelet type on Willebrand's disease, but not in type 2B. Pretty high false positive rates if the platelets aren't washed properly, as you might imagine. There are some other sort of ristocetin induced platelet aggregation or RIPA type mixing studies out there as well. But really, genetic testing is probably the way to go. And so I think that's what happened here, right? Y'all sent off the genetic testing? Yep. And our patient's genetic testing came back with mutations involving the A1 domain of the von Willebrand factor gene on chromosome 12. And this secured the diagnosis of type 2B von Willebrand disease. For the longest time, and this is to the, this recording today, I did not know what platelet type von Willebrand disease is, and it makes so much sense. Instead of the von Willebrand factor having the mutation, your platelet GP1B receptor has the mutation. And it's as simple as that. that is, that's fascinating. And of course, it would present the same way. Clinically, it would, it would cause the same phenotype. So we've diagnosed our patient. A few months later, he comes back to the office and lets you know that it turns out his new health insurance is even better than he expected. He's planning on having a combination rhinoplasty, cheekbone augmentation, tummy tuck, and pectoral six-pack ab implants to get ready for the beach this summer. His multidisciplinary surgery team wants to know how to keep him safe during the operation and recovery, telling you this span will be a work of art when we're finished. 
We don't want any unsightly bruising or hematomas to compromise our work. So Ronak, how would you proceed with perioperative management in this patient? Well, Vivek, I mean, that's certainly quite the conundrum, and I really do appreciate his team looking out for him. If he's going to undergo this extensive work to get the body of his dreams for the beach this summer, they want good cosmetic outcomes. So listeners, remember the perioperative management and bleeding management. We kind of started talking about this last time, and we'll expand on it a little bit more this time. So remember in the type 1 patients, and now as we learn the type 2A patients, they have an appropriate response to DDAVP. So remember that you want to be sure that you're doing these simulation challenges in advance of the surgery, and that way you know that it's working and that you can consider the use of DDAVP then if it does work for minor surgeries or minor bleeding. So that could be one of your recommendations. Although this procedure does not really sound that minor. It sounds like he's going to get quite a bit of work done. And besides in type 2B, in 2M, 2N, and type 3, we have to use exogenous factor replacement as their main strategy, much like we would in hemophilia. And as we discuss in our hemophilia episodes, you know, you're trying to use these factor replacements to get their factor levels up to a certain number. The goal here is to try to restore activity to 100% or 100 international units per deciliter, and then to keep it above 50% for several days following the surgery. Usually we recommend like three to five days if it's a minor procedure, but as many as seven to 14 days for a major procedure. And that's to ensure that you're maintaining that hemostasis necessary to ensure that the patient doesn't have tremendous bleeding uh, postoperatively. Similar to hemophilia, where we're trying to achieve a certain amount of activity or a certain value, as we know now, in type 1 von Willebrand's disease, they already have some factor around. So, therefore, it makes sense that they're going to require lower doses of factor replacement as compared to someone with like a type 2 or a type 3. The subsequent doses that you're going to give this patient are usually about half the initial dose given at the approximate half-life of this product, so roughly between 8 and 24 hours is what's used for most patients. Remember, though, that the, quote, half-life of the product will be very patient-specific. So, you know, we see this on patients that get admitted to the hospital for these sorts of procedures all the time. So let me give you an example. So if you have a type 1 von Willebrand's disease patient that gets surgery, some patients see rapid clearance of their von Willebrand's factors, and others will ramp up production in response to the stress from the surgery and may be able to maintain levels greater than 100% for a day or so following surgery all on their own. So what that means, though, is that we very, very, very carefully need to monitor their levels to figure out what someone's dosing schedule will be. It's almost like thinking back to college, if anybody did those growth curves on bacteria, you're essentially trying to figure out what their activity levels are pretty regularly so you understand how to dose these patients with additional factor. The other thing that we want to monitor in addition to their von Willebrand's factor is also their factor VIII activity levels. So these patients don't have any trouble making factor VIII despite their low levels on baseline testing. And when normal von Willebrand's factor is introduced, though, their endogenous factor VIII has an increased half-life. And so you can end up dose stacking. And so this is why you want to try to keep their factor VIII levels below about 250%. So Again, I think if we take a step back and try to remember the pathophysiology of this disease and what's happening in the different disease subtypes, I think at least for me now, it better explains why we take the approach that we take. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned all those things. It's really, really important. It's almost counterintuitive, but patients with absent von Willebrand factor productions, so your type 3 von Willebrand disorder, it's almost easier to figure out how they're going to behave after a procedure because they aren't able to ramp up their production of von Willebrand's. In patients with type 1 von Willebrand disorder or these type 2s, because von Willebrand's factor is an acute phase reactant, oftentimes, as you mentioned, with the stress of surgery, they're going to ramp up their own production. Their half-life is going to be changing as they progress and get further out from surgery and that acute phase reactant effect kind of calms down. Factor level monitoring is really important to help us inform dosing. And the factor eight level tends to be something that can limit the amount of doses you can give. Oftentimes, you'll end up with pretty high factor eight levels, depending on what product you use. 
their von Willebrand's factor may be right around that 50 to 70 percent range, kind of at the lower end of, of where you want them. But that's just something you have to work with. And the monitoring, again, really helps you out there. So what kind of options do we have in terms of factor products we can give? So there are multiple types of factor products we can give and check out our show notes for some of the names, but I'm just going to give us a few. So there's two big categories here. Category number one is human derived products, and that would contain both von Willebrand factor and factor eight because von Willebrand factor is complex with factor eight. Remember that chaperone activity. This is dosed by ristocetin cofactor activity units. And the ratio of von Willebrand factor activity to factor eight activity differs between the products. So each of them have a different dosing strategy. The brand names include Humate P. I remember that for humans, human derived Humate P, Alphanate, and Willate. Look these up, check out our show notes, but we're just going to talk about Humate P, the human derived product, Humate for human, as it has the highest ratio of von Willebrand factor to factor eight, two to one. And you get into less trouble with the dose stacking activity that, that Dan had just talked about, that you don't want to get above that 250% and risk forming thrombus, actual like things like DVT and other clots. So usually we give a loading dose of 40 to 60 units per kilogram, but sometimes those type 3 patients who really are making no von Willebrand, they have that hemophilia phenotype, they may need as much as 80 units per kilogram. So if you're not human-derived, we also have lab-derived recombinant products. And I remember this brand name because it's fancy and recombinant products are fancy, so Von Vendi, the fancy one. And it's only approved in adults. There's no factor 8, so this needs to be co-administered with factor 8 for the loading dose and patients with very low baseline levels of factor 8. For patients with less decreased levels, their endogenous factor 8 should increase to greater than 40% within six hours of a dose of Von Vendi. Some patients who have issues with severe factor 8 dose stacking during recovery from surgery, this can be a good alternative to that typical human-derived product, that Humate product that we've been talking about. And this is also dosed by ristocetin cofactor units but has a much longer half-life and is predominantly composed of the most effective high molecular weight multimers. So what's our plan for this patient? They're about to get this major, you know, they're going to look good for the beach. So how do we make sure our guy looks good? What are we going to do? We came up with a plan and we went ahead and recommended a dose of 60 ristocetin cofactor units per kilogram of Humate P to be administered 30 to 60 minutes prior to surgery followed by daily von Willebrand factor antigen, ristocetin cofactor level, and factor eight activity level assays, and a tentative plan for 30 ristocetin cofactor units per kilogram every 12 hours after surgery. Although his factor eight level got up as high as 240% on post-op day five, and his platelet count did dip into the 60,000 per microliter range during his recovery, overall, we managed to keep his parameters within range, And he walks into your office a few weeks later, a shining Adonis, barely recognizable from the man you first met. This was just a great case, and it it wrapped up so well. I mean, our patient did really well. We all learned a lot. I finally learned what platelet type von Willebrand disease is. So let's do a a quick review. Ronak, do you want to review what we discussed today? I'll start, and then maybe one of you guys can finish. So so what I took away from today is that the type 2 von Willebrand's disease subtypes are representative of disorders of the von Willebrand's factor function, meaning that they are qualitative disorders. So we learned about several types. 2A is loss of the high molecular weight multimers, and as Vivek said, A for high achieving, or also A for absent, loss of high molecular weight multimers. And the congenital form is due to mutations that make it easier for enzymatic cleavage of the von Willebrand's factor multimers. Type 2B is a loss of the high molecular weight multimers, but it's because of a gain of function mutation that makes it easier for von Willebrand's factor to aggregate platelets and is often associated with thrombocytopenia as well. Type 2M is the opposite of 2B. These are patients that have decreased platelet binding, and there's also a form with decreased collagen binding, and remember M for matrix. As a result, you see a decreased ratio like in 2A and 2B, but with normal multimer distribution and preservation of high molecular weight multimers.
And then 2n and n for Normandy is related to a decreased factor 8 binding. And remember that Normandy has eight letters, and so this is decreased factor 8 binding. And as a result, the factor 8 is low and out of proportion to von Willebrand's factor. This can be misdiagnosed as hemophilia A as a result, and especially since the type 2N von Willebrand's factor is less common than hemophilia A. That was great recap there, and I just want to just one more time. A, high achieving, just high molecular weight multiple loss. B, binds platelets. M for matrix or M for multimer because you have normal multimers and 2N Normandy has eight letters. So you have factor eight problems and some final takeaway points for management here. It's important to note that the treatment of minor bleeding and minor surgery are similar as are the treatment of major bleeding and major surgery. The strategy for all these events is to get the functional factor activity level up to 100% then maintain levels above 50% for three to five days after minor events, minor bleeding or minor surgery, and seven to 14 days after major events, major bleeding or major surgery. Ristocetin cofactor levels may not be available every day depending on your local lab's capability, so make sure you understand what their schedule is and the monitoring plan just to be realistic about how to dose these patients. It's reasonable to primarily trend the von Willebrand factor antigen levels and the factor eight activity, with intermittent correlation with the ristocetin cofactor in these patients with qualitative functional issues. So that's all that I've got for today. Dan, do you have anything else for us to wrap this up? Yeah. And, you know, just to add on to what you were saying about the ristocetin cofactor, this is a really important point in generally understanding what your lab's availability is for esoteric coagulation testing and all sorts of other specialized heme-related testing is important, similar to, to what you were saying with type 2N as in Normandy, type 1 and type 3, we really don't need to bother trending receipt cofactor activity either just because we know that that's not going to really change our management plan. But no, I think you guys hit it. I'm glad that we were able to go through this and uh, and finally pin down some of these different types of von Willebrand disorder. It, it's something that I always found very confusing in training. And only now that I'm being exposed to it all the time in clinic and on consults, uh, am I really kind of getting a better feel for it. Yeah, this is a great episode. And That wraps it up for me. Hope everyone has a good day. We'll see you later. All right, guys. See you later. Peace. Peace.